so today we're talking about the White Star Line service to Australia. And as you can see, we'll be following in the track of the sunshine via South Africa to Australia. Uh, I've got a quote up there on the screen from Lord Kyle Sant, and there's a certain irony in that because, of course, in the 1920s, Kyle Sant had uh, expanded into uh, the Australia trade, which had up until then been uh, neglected through the 20s. And it was that expansion that actually helped to lead to the demise of the White Star Line uh, and its merger with Cunard in 1934. But the sentiment he expresses here, uh, the idea that in the public mind, the White Star Line trade is associated more often with the North Atlantic trade, uh, whereas it had its beginnings in Australia is quite accurate. Um, it uh, the, the, the trade might have begun uh, with Australia, but of course, it's the glamorous North Atlantic liners, I think, that have continued to capture the public's imagination. And of course, the Olympic class vessels and great liners like the Oceanic II of uh, 1899 overshadows somewhat uh, the vessels and the uh, and the service that uh, that ran to Australia but it was an important part of the White Star Line history and also it was innovative and quite important to the development of liner trade and communications within Australia so that's going to be our our focus today the Titanic might creep in on occasion but I promise to keep it to a minimum so let's go back to the very beginning uh, and the clipper ships that so captured the imagination of the world in the 19th century. Uh, the White Star Line has its origins in 1845 when the line was founded by John Pilkington and Henry Wilson. It was focused on the UK-Australia trade, but of course it really expanded in the 1850s with the gold rush and uh, a tremendous influx of uh, immigration and increased trade between the countries. Now, um, the line itself uh, first charted and then commissioned its own vessels. And we see a couple here of the, the really legendary ones. The red jacket, which gave its name to the line, um, it had a figurehead of uh, an American, a Native American with a white star on his chest. Uh, there was advertising material produced where he was holding a pennant that gave us the white star. And of course, later there was the white star clipper named after the vessel. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, there was a difference in direction between the, um, uh, the two founders of the line, uh, John Pilkington and Henry Wilson. Uh, Pilkington was a bit dubious of Wilson's more expansive, uh, ambitious projects and the fact that he was pressing not only for advertising greater speed, but also ever larger ships. And uh, so Pilkington left the line. Um, James Chambers joined. He was the brother-in-law of, um, uh, of Wilson. But when the Royal Bank of Liverpool failed in October 1867, uh, White Star was left with what was then an astronomical debt of about £527,000 and was forced to declare bankruptcy. Uh, now, at this point, Thomas Ismay, who was a, then a director of the National Line, uh, was able to purchase the house flag, the name and the goodwill of the company for about £1,000. Um, but the White Star Line never really lost a sense of the glamour of those early days. And we can see there the, um, that illustration of the red jacket dates to the 1920s. This particular um, use of it was from a, uh, a calendar, I think. But you also see in a lot of the advertising material from the teens and 20s, you'll see these very romantic images of the, um, of the early White Star Line vessels um, used for White Star Line uh, material. You can argue how strong the connection was given that it was, it was really primarily the, um, uh, the name and the goodwill that the company purchased, but they certainly were keen to emphasize that connection with those early days in the Australian trade. In fact, it's outlined as the, Austra the White Star Australian packet. Um, Ismay himself um, joined forces with uh, a businessman called Imbri. Imbri tended to handle, there was still a white star line, well, not a white star line, but a Ismay and Imri sailing connection. Imri handled the sailing ships too, uh, which included uh, service to Australia. That's a whole other story, which I think deserves better treatment. But Ismay, of course, was very much focused on building up the North Atlantic trade and for a time there, the Australian connection was, uh, was rather tenuous indeed. 
Now, there were some early Australian, um, early Australian connections in the history of the line. Of course, at this point, the focus is very much North Atlantic. You had the, uh, the Oceanic and its successors, which were quite innovative. Uh, they, the White Star Line had formed a partnership with Harland and Wolfe um, and uh, uh, were constructing what were then um, groundbreaking new vessels. Uh, they were looking at, um, they were looking at uh, uh, transatlantic trade. Um, however, in 1883, they did inaugurate a service really to nice. New Zealand. Now, this is um, was done in compunction with Shaw Savile. It was done in um, uh, partnership with Shaw Savile. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of echo there. Well, that's to be a just ask everyone to move the if you could mute your yeah if you could mute the um uh, if you could mute your um, thank you very much um uh, in, uh, white star line inaugurated a service uh to new zealand shores in partnership with Shaw, Shaw savile the ships were built by harland and wolf we've got the doric and the Ionic there, and of course there was the Corinthic as well. Um, but they did call at um, uh, Hobart on their way to New Zealand, and they were manned by a White Star Line crew. So a White Star Line built and manned ship, but operated by Shaw Savile. Tenuous, but yes, still in partnership. They also flew both house flags. There were other vessels that were chartered by the Australian government and we had visits from the Belgic there and the Arabic. Uh, these were one-offs uh, taking a, um, a large groups of immigrants to ports, including Melbourne and uh, Melbourne and Sydney. But the White Star Line service to Australia really is reinvigorated and reinaugurated by the Jubilee class, uh, so-called, of course, because in 1897, Queen Victoria was celebrating her Jubilee, and this is when the concept gained, uh, gained currency and the, uh, the White Star Line uh, started working towards this net, was envisioned as a monthly service, um, five vessels and a single class. Uh, the first two we have there, the um, uh, the, uh, the the Medic and the Afric. The Afric was completed first. The Medic soon followed. They were about twelve thousand tons. They were so successful and, and um, uh, carried. Hang on, I do have their their passenger thing. Uh, twelve thousand tons, three hundred and twenty passengers. They proved to be so successful that the subsequently launched in the second round of vessels ordered from Harlan and Wolf including the Swavik and the Runic, had their tonnage increased, increased by about, uh, about 500 tonnes and had room for an additional 80 passengers. Uh, the concept of the single class appealed very much to both the migrant trade that they were courting and also to the somewhat egalitarian spirit of the Australian audience who's li who liked the idea. There, were, there was a lot of talk in the newspaper at the time about the sensitivities, the more sensitive among our, um, our travellers who did not wish to be relegated to third class. And the idea of a passenger ship in which all, the passen all of passenger country was accessible uh, was very appealing. Um, the trade-off, of course, was that we don't see the grand public spaces that we do in a lot of the Atlantic liners. However, they were very comfortable uh, accommodations. I think we'll have a look at a few of them here. Um, comfortable accommodations. You can see they look somewhat more sparse and functional than what was available on the North Atlantic in the first class, but uh, very comparable to some of the, uh, if not superior to some of the third class that was available at the turn of the century. Um, we had general rooms, there was a library, writing room, um, dining saloon that could fit up to 500 people. Um, there's even a piano you can see up there on the left. There were two pianos furnished to each class and we'll talk a bit about shipboard entertainment in a moment. Uh, they do look um, a little bit darkly furnished here, but what was commented on in a lot of these early passengers was how well lit and well ventilated they were. They were extremely comfortable, but even more so than that was the fact that they were accessible. The Australian wage in 1902, the average Australian wage in 1902 was 43 pounds and six shillings. Uh, a round trip fare at the time 
prior to this, uh, the launch of the Australia service could run as high as £120 if you were going to travel in any sort of uh, comfort. <laughs> um, it was quite revolutionary then, and it was very well received, particularly on the Australian end, when a single fare uh, could be had for £19 and a return fare for £34. Uh, so this not only facilitated the migration of people coming to Australia, it meant that a possible round trip was within the means, I'm a bit of a stretch, but it was within the means of more than just the very wealthy. Having successfully launched the Jubilee class, in 1912, White Star followed with the ceramic, uh, which was celebrated as the Queen of the Southern Seas. Now, um, we all know stories about happy ships and unhappy ships and how their crew feel about them. The ceramic really seems to have been regarded very warmly by both crew and passengers. It was at uh, 18 and a half thousand tonnes, by far the largest uh, vessel on the run. It, super, it superseded uh, uh, any um, it, its, uh, its predecessors. And uh, it was an improvement on the, uh, on the Jubilee class. You now had <laughs> a gymnasium, um, two pools, uh, one for, on the upper decks, one for women and one for men, uh, and even more expanded space, better food, and a run that could really rival um, the Suez Canal route, and we'll talk about that a bit in a moment. And here we just have some objects from uh, and photographs from the collection. I have to admit I have a soft spot for the ceramic. It is uh, one of my favourite White Star Line vessels. Uh, these were not the only White Star Line vessels that called at Australia during this time. These are primarily uh, cargo ships. Now, a couple of these, I, I think it's it's not even recognised in some of the um, in some of the line histories that they even called at Australia. For example, the Bovic and the Georgic. Now, as the name suggests, with Bovic, these were built as live li as uh, livestock transport. They were literal cattle boats. Uh, the Georgic at about 10,000 tonnes was the largest ever built for that purpose on the North Atlantic run. Um, uh, in fact, it was of such a substantial size that it occasionally encountered difficulties manoeuvring into ports in, in North America. But then um, in, for a fleeting moment there in 1909, they came to Australia. Now, the photographer who shot these, Samuel J. Hood, these were all photographed in Sydney. Uh, Samuel Hood was a very enterprising man who recognised um, uh, the need to record and also to capture certain artistic scenes. Part of this was he was capturing these images to sell to the crews, but also um, a lot of these vessels, for example, when the Georgic first sailed to Australia, it was recognised that it was a... a, a the largest cargo vessel of its type that had yet come to Australia. Um, in fact, the largest cargo vessel that had come to Australia of any type. And so it was worth capturing these moments. There was a lot of local interest and excitement when they arrived here. Uh, now, of course, they weren't transporting livestock at the time. Um, they did bring, uh, the White Star Line ships did bring some livestock, but it tended to be smaller group, you know, um, uh, bloodstock for breeding that was coming out from the UK. So it tended to be from England to Australia rather than vice versa. Primarily what they were doing, and they were converted for this use, was uh, carrying refrigerated units that had, uh, were able to store mutton, beef, uh, and then other general cargo, fruit, was uh, was a frequent um, was a frequent cargo. We'll talk about that in a moment. Skins, rabbits, uh, and so on. So these were essentially refitted cargo vessels for the use, adapted as livestock vessels, but um, converted for use uh, on the frozen meat trade. So here are the routes they took. Now there's a lot of variations in these, but the general. Uh, start to the Australia trade. And this is primarily the passenger trade, which we're most interested in. Uh, outward bound calling at Liverpool, Plymouth, Cape Town, Albany, Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney. And then on the homeward voyage, uh, very similar, but Durban, uh, calling also at Durban, Tenerife, um, Plymouth and London. And we also have the steamers leaving in February and March and April, including Hobart and loading up on fruit. And there's a lovely little shot there of the Afric. Uh, shipping apples at Hobart. And I love that image there from uh, Princeton University Library Street, uh, American Express giving us steamship routes of the world. And 
by 1914, things were changing, they were tweaked. Um, 1914, the run was extended to Brisbane uh, via Newcastle. Um, you also have the question of whether or not these ships could go via the Suez Canal. Uh, it was asked first in 1899 when they inaugurated the Jubilee class. It was also asked again on the eve of the ceramics uh, visit. But of course, the problem was accommodating ships of this rapidly increasing size through the Suez Canal. P&O usually took the Suez Canal. It was a, it was a quicker route. But um, a ship of the ceramics draft uh, would have great difficulty doing it. It did manage it during World War I and promptly grounded but was able to be refloated. Uh, so they took the, um, they took the route via uh, via Cape Town and uh, the Cape of Good Hope. But um, uh, with adaptions to the Suez Canal, this was tweaked in later years. And for example, in 1920, the ceramic did take at least one, I'm still uh, mapping out all her voyages, but uh, it did take at least one route that took it via um, India to Australia, which is more a P&O route um, going via Suez Canal, India to Australia, but um, <laughs> you do find these adaptations and sometimes particularly with the cargo ships, they would also go on to, uh, go on to New Zealand. And now the passengers, and we have some lovely images there. Now, going back to the Sam Hood collection, we have a number of unidentified passengers that I am working on. Um, he obviously was interested in photographing interesting, stylish celebrities, anyone of particular note, um, possibly for sale to the newspapers, um, passengers that were of interest. So we're still working through and identifying them. And at the end, I'll give you a slide where we um, invite you to have a look at some of our, um, uh, a link so you can have a look at our collection and possibly even conduct a bit of um, uh, citizen historian work and maybe identify some of these passengers. I'm still working on this um, uh, gentleman there, the Swavik passenger. Um, I love that that uh, crate there that gives hello. you the idea of how, hello. Um, yes. yes, I'm there. Okay, can just might oh, be I best thought, to mute. So I thought you would. That's all right. I'll 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 take questions at the end. Um, we also have a lovely group of passengers there photographed by Harold Lowe, uh, notable as the ti Titanic's fifth officer. This is much later in his career when he sailed as an officer on the ceramic in the 1920s. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful immigrant group. Now, what was life like? How did one pass one's time? Now, I think every single one of these activities is familiar um, to a cruise ship passenger today who uh, has travelled and crossed the line. We have a crossing the line ceremony. These were popular. There's a gorgeous description from a runic voyage very early on uh, in which they describe how the crew would amuse themselves when they approached the equator by stringing a single hair across a telescope and handing it to a, uh, a passenger and asking them if they could see the equatorial line looking through mm -hmm. it. Um, of course, the Neptune's court, there'd, there'd be, the ship would receive a telegram a day in advance informing them that Neptune would come aboard and he wanted to see, you know, anyone who had first crossed the line had to be granted right of passage and the court would assemble, there'd be mock trials and all sorts of rituals that the uh, passengers could participate to the degree they liked. I know in one case a passenger decided it was all getting a bit too... Uh, a bit too boisterous and they decide to go below decks. And then we have uh, Lily Napton, who's left us a lovely collection here at the museum. She has a lot more objects that she brought out as a migrant when she travelled with her mother um, to join their father who had already gone ahead to Australia. But I particularly love the coit and ball that were made by a sailor on board demonstrating that uh, traditional skill with rope work. And you can see, of course, there in that um, 1910s advertisement there, um, deck coits and games on board. And then we have uh, Harold Lowe again in one, from one of his photo albums uh, in the 1920s, obviously borrowing very heavy, heavily from Rudolph Valentino. Uh, the, the fancy dress party then as now is a staple at sea. And given the length of the voyage, they often staged more than one fancy, um, fancy dress party. Um, you also had... Um, 
uh, in addition to deck games and cricket and so on on deck, uh, they would uh, they would host dances when the weather was fine on deck. And of course, with those two pianos on the Jubilee class, there was a uh, an opportunity for people to make their own entertainment and get up ships concerts. I have to say, I've looked at some of the titles of some of the um, some of the lectures that were offered, and I don't know whether I could do an entire series of talks on the state of the modern church, as was one of the offerings, but the passengers who heard it apparently thoroughly enjoyed it. So uh, I will cast no criticisms. And now, of course, the crew. Again, we have some unidentified, I'm very hopeful of identifying the medics person there. There's only so many voyages and there's only um, so many crewmen. And with the use of the National Archives in Britain and the, uh, the uh, uh, CR10 records, I am hopeful of identifying that gentleman. Unfortunately, the others, while we might be able to tell ranks, they're a little bit more difficult because we don't know the vessels they came from. We only know that they are from the White Star Line. And I love the gentleman there in the middle with the frock coat worn over his summer whites. Now, of course, the summer white uniform, which we see with the purser and with the uh, engineer there on the left, um, they were worn um, uh, they were worn in tropical conditions or during the summer months. Um, normally one did not wear them with a frock coat, which is the most formal article of attire, but uh, it was a it was a long voyage out. It was about 50 days. Um, it could be a four month round voyage. They were often responsible for the upkeep of their own uniforms and washing facilities could be a little bit primitive. So there's a going through this collection of photographs, I've seen quite a lot of crew, um, in, especially the officers, uh, whose uniform does not uh, conform to the standards. Charles Lightoller, when he wrote uh, Titanic and Other Ships, he mentions uh, when he joined the Medic in 1900, half his uniform was missing. It was lost somewhere on the railways. And when he was told he had to join the Medic the following day and crew were expected to provide their own uniforms, he blurted out, you know, goodness, I've got no clothes. And the Marine superintendent told him he'd just better go and get some. And so he set off to Australia with uh, less than half of um, half of what he should have been wearing. And having a look at the um, this collection from the, the Hood studio, I can say he was certainly not the only one who was uh, not particularly dressing by the book. And there's that charming photo down there of the officers and crew of the Gallic uh, in a football team in 1922. Uh, Gallic at this time was a uh, cargo ship sailing to New Zealand via Australia. Um, they engaged in quite a number, they were regulars out of all the White Star Liners. They were probably the most regular when it came to um, uh, dancing in uh, to playing in um, Stockton um, near Newcastle where a lot of the games were held and the, the Gallic team seemed to do pretty well. And here are some photos of the other three departments. Now, we don't know which departments they represent. I suspect that many of these are stokers or firemen. Um, uh, we have at least one uh, deck crewman there wearing his, with his white Starline tally band and the others may be stewards. There were, of course, three departments. You had the deck crew who were those that were in charge of the navigation and the general running of the ship. You had the victualling department, which included the purses and the stewards. They were looking after the passengers. And then of course you had the engineering department, which were those who managed the machinery that propelled the ship, both the engineering officers who oversaw them. And of course the, the firemen, the trimmers, the people that kept the boilers going and kept the engines running, the grease, the people that kept the machinery going. They could be a very uh, tough lot. There are all sorts of, stories. Charles Lightoller tells a story about an engineering officer that got, officer that got into a dispute uh, with, um, uh, with one of, they were known as the Black Gang because they dealt with the coal, um, got into a dispute with a member of the engineering crew and uh, was never seen again. It was suspected he was hit over the head with a shovel and uh, put in a, um, uh, put in one of the, um, in, in one of the furnaces. Now the was quite a lot of crew and passenger interaction. There were romances on board. Three of the Titanic's officers uh, met their wives on the Australian and New Zealand run. Um, there was not supposed to be fraternisation. There very clearly was. Um, but there were also a lot of very friendly associations that, um, that gave rise. And I just had to include these. It's a bit indulgent because, of course, I wrote Lowe's 
biography, but um, I love this story. Um, 1913, Lowe is on his second voyage out to Australia after the Titanic disaster, and he's on the Gothic. In Sydney, they pick up, they board a passenger by the name of Harry Pierce. That's the gentleman there with the kangaroo on his uh, vest. Um, he uh, was a champion rower. He was on his way to England to participate in the uh, international championships. He, unfortunately, he failed to win. But he said later that the crew of the Gothic uh, and the officers, he singled them out for special appreciation because they had gone out of their way to make sure that he did not lose fitness. He was able to train. They facilitated his training regime through the voyage and he spoke very highly of, um, of how, they, um, how they assisted him. Um, and then... The Harold Lowe is the second figure from the left standing. And then down there we have another group. Now, I know we can see both the rowers. You can see the other, the, the chap with the rose who presumably is representing England. He's down there in the far right. Don't know what this assembly of people was. It's from the Lowe family collection. Uh, but you can see Lowe there and he's wearing his watch chain quite prominently that was presented to him in the wake of the Titanic disaster with a sovereign hanging from it that was presented to him by a surviving first class passenger. But there seated in front of him is Harry Pierce. Now, this friendship continued even after the war. And there on the right, you see photos from Lowe's album taken in the 90s, uh, taken in the 1920s. Um, post-war period where he was traveling down to Australia again on the ceramic, the younger man who's with him is Bobby Pierce, who would go on to become one of Australia's greatest Olympic athletes during this period. And there were these lovely photos. We actually used them at the museum when we acquired one of Bobby Pierce's um, skull shells for the, for the collection. Um, our historic vessels curator, the Lowe family, kindly let us consult the album. And there are photos taken here at Penrith and then photos that we suspect were taken at Henley. So obviously they met up in both England and Australia whenever they could. There's also a charming story about um, Pierce and Lowe conspiring together to try and get a koala for Harold Lowe's son and um, uh, attempting to induce Taronga Zoo to hand one over. And uh, Taronga Zoo very rightfully did not do so to um, the lasting regret of Harold Lowe Jr. But there's a wonderful little piece inscribed from um, from Harry Pierce to Harold Lowe, uh, great pals. And it's this charming friendship that started on a voyage in 1913 and it continued through the remainder of their lives. And now we come to the notorious um, uh, one gun salute, um, what one officer and a group of apprentices, what trouble can they get up to in Sydney Harbour? Uh, spring night, 1900, the meeting is in port and there is a muffled, muffled explosion. It wasn't a shattering explosion. It did not alert the police ashore. It did not alert nearby Cockatoo Island, which was a naval base. It did not even wake the caretaker on Fort Denison, which is the fort in the middle of the harbour. However, it was noticed by a few nearby ships. The following morning, the caretaker found a piece of canvas that looked like it had been painted up as a Boer flag. Now, of course, this is 1900. We're in the middle of the Second Boer War. Sydney siders were tremendously caught up in the war furor. And of course, there was discussion were there Boer sympathisers that had possibly sabotaged Fort Denison? Uh, the commentary tended to run, it was much more likely to be a practical joke. And in fact, it was noted that some of the British blue jackets in the harbour had been talking about how to access Fort Denison. There was a question raised in New South Wales Parliament. We have it there, you know, what, what's the story? How, do we know there's a report of a gun having been fired? Are the guns loaded at night? I'll investigate it. There was no follow-up, by the way. I, I, um, the question remained unanswered, but the answer is no. There were a group of eight-inch guns and a largely decorative one mounted at the top of the Martello Tower. Now, the whole mystery as to this incident, this odd incident, was answered in 1936 when Charles Lightoller uh, published Titanic and other ships, and he explained that, yes, he was the one behind it. He and a group of apprentices had seen, and they were vastly amused by this bristly little fort, this tiny little fort in the middle of a harbour. Um, 
which was obviously of limited defensive capabilities, but it was mounted with this fabulous um, but largely ornamental gun. And so they had organised um, this expedition to the harbour in the middle of the night and had loaded it with um, old wadding. It was an actual shot. It, if it had been, the gun might have exploded and killed the person firing it um, and had run up the ball flag, which was this painted bit of canvas. Um, it was a lot more dramatic in Lightholder's retelling. Uh, it gained many more column inches in 1936 when his book was published than it did in 1900. But Charles Lightholder always could tell a very good story. And then we have the, the Swavik. Now, the Swavik tends to be remembered now because it is one of the most remarkable um, uh, salvage efforts of the 20th century. But I think far more, um, it, well, not more important, but at least as important is the remarkable rescue effort that took place. Uh, now, the uh, Swavik was inbound um, approaching Plymouth on the night of the 17th of March at 10.30 when because there was heavy fog, rain coming in, there was a southwesterly blowing. Uh, they couldn't take celestial observations, so they were relying on calculations that actually put them 16 miles ahead of where they thought they were. They were also assuming that they would see the Lizard Lighthouse, uh, which is why they ran full speed onto the rocks at the Lizard, um, grounded heavily. Uh, it was at about 10.30 at night, so uh, you can imagine the scenario. It was um, a, a fairly heavy, heavy crash, um, and there were, there were some 382 passengers and 141 people on board, and they responded very calmly. The passengers had a lot of praise for the crew, they were all assembled with their life jackets on deck. Uh, the women drank tea in the general room. Uh, the men were in the smoking room smoking. But what followed was a remarkable evacuation led by the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Um, there were only 60 locals called from various life stations along the coast uh, and four open boats, and yet they managed to rescue every single passenger, including about 70 uh, young people and infants, um, landed with heavy seas pounding the ships. There's, there's accounts of the passengers as they evacuated and how absolutely terrifying it was because the heavy seas were driving. They were, they were afraid they were going to be driven into the side of the ship. Um, the fact that the RNLI accomplished this rescue, it was the largest rescue in their, what will be next year, their 200 year history is uh, an absolute uh, credit and um, a, a remarkable feat. Um, after that though, followed what is probably the most interesting um, salvage story of uh, the early 20th century. There had been a few similar ones, but much smaller vessels and with very mixed results. But at first, of course, it was thought that the whole vessel was a write-off, but the Liverpool and Glasgow uh, Salvage Company believed that it might be possible to salvage the 400-foot 400, 400 section of the stern. This had the engines and the passenger quarters and they were in perfect condition. They were very buoyant, whereas the bow was fixed so fast on the rocks there was going to be no moving it. Uh, so. The, they decided that it was possible um, in an age before acetylene torches, they planted dynamite charges and they separated the two sections. The stern then proceeded <laughs> under um, uh, uh, all, uh, uh, with its engines astern, uh, uh, um, pulled astern, uh, managed to steam backwards to Southampton escorted by tugs, but largely under its own steam. The White Star Line commissioned a new bow built to the same specifications, just a bit longer because there was some overlap so they could join them at uh, Harland and Wolf, which gave rise to that charming little waggery that the Swavik was in that year the longest ship in the world because it had its stern in Southampton and its bow in Belfast. Um, eventually, the bow was taken down to Southampton, 
they were able to rejoin the two parts in what is a a, a real credit to Harland and Wolf Engineering. Um, they fitted perfectly. And the Swavik went on to serve a long career. It was eventually uh, sold on when the White Star Line sold off its Australian assets. It was uh, purchased. It went to um, it went to uh, Norway as a whaling ship, and it was scuttled by its own crew in World War II. Uh, so they didn't manage to sink the Swavik. It was sunk by its own crew in time of war. Uh, so it's this it, it's this absolutely incredible incredible story both in the rescue and also in the way in which the vessel was salvaged now i've talked about why the white star line ships were such a success but of course not every voyage is um is quite as successful not every immigrant experience is quite as um as glowing as those I've depicted. And we'll take the, the Belgic as an example of a voyage gone very astray. Uh, it was launched in America. It wasn't a Harlan and Wolf built line. It was bought by the Red Star Line. They named it the Sam Land. And then in 1911, it came under the control of the, um, and I might just, um, I think we're probably reaching our limit there, Emily. Um, might be a good place to pause. That sounds like a lovely thing. Now, everyone, <laughs> uh, you will see in the chat the link to the second part of this meeting. Please do join us there. I will push start. And my sincere apologies to everyone who has had to join us late because I screwed up the Zoom links. I, I'm so sorry that you've had to miss some of Inga's beautiful presentation. Please note that we are recording it and it will all be made available to you. So I will now close this meeting, um, giving everybody time to, to join the second part of the meeting. I will also email this to all attendees now. And to, uh, I'd like to have a great chatting. Okay, um, so resuming our story, uh, I think thus far I have painted what has been, aside from a shipwreck, uh, has been a fairly rosy portrait of migration and the um, experiences that um, uh, passengers had with the White Star Line vessels. But unfortunately, uh, that of course was not always the case. And in 1911, the White Star Line um, started operation of the Belgic. Now, the Belgic was not a Harland and Wolf built vessel. It had um, uh, started its service in America. It was built in America. It had then been purchased by the Red Star Line and had uh, um, been uh, operating as the Sam Land. In 1911, the White Star Line chartered it for the immigration trade, naming it the Belgic. Um, it had been refitted for the voyage, but apparently not very adequately. Now, it's interesting reading accounts because, of course, you have uh, Captain Thornton, who was very keen on downplaying the difficulties of the voyage, and then you have the versions told by the crew, and then you have, of course, the experience of the people on board. And that experience by all accounts seems to, by well, at least by the passenger accounts, seems to have been horrific from the start. Um, by the time you get to Cape Town, um, reach South Africa, they have been facing uh, appalling weather. The wireless broke down, and at one point it was even thought the ship might be lost. The, uh, there was a coal bunker fire. Those of you who know the story of the Titanic would be familiar with how um, common coal bunker fires were, but it was still something that had to be dealt with. A crewman had been swept overboard Two young children had died. The cause of death was given as malnutrition. Um, another child who was only 10 years old had died of an apparent heart condition. So that's all bad enough. But unfortunately, the ship itself does not seem to have been adequate for the adequately equipped for what was a very long ocean voyage. The lavatories, which were located amidships, were very poorly ventilated and apparently extremely unclean and unsanitary, so much so that even in that age of questionable sanitation, the uh, passengers were recording it, so they'll probably send yeah. it out. Exactly. <laughs> I just just write ask people yeah put it on mute um, if uh, if you haven't already done so um, so uh, 
the food as well was a particular cause of complaint. Uh, some of the passengers said that it felt they felt as if the, the meat might walk. And even if something was moderately good, it was said to have the Belgic taint about it. Um, there was also a lot of conflict between the um, between the um, uh, the crew and the officers. Uh, there was one of the firemen had come into conflict with a um, one of the engineers had been arrested in Cape Town was supposed to have been left there but due to a due to a uh, mix-up he actually left with the ship so by the time they arrived in Western Australia in Fremantle uh, things were reaching a bit of a powder keg the crew were very unhappy that they were being kept away from the passengers um, the passengers, when they spoke to them, were being told the Belgic was unstable, that it would sink, that it would never make its way across the Australian Bight. So tensions were rising. It finally comes to a head when Captain Thornton was trying to round up his crew to depart Fremantle. And as soon as he got two or three people aboard, two or three crew would leave. And so he was ready to cast off and stand off from the wharf. Um, you had crew telling him, we can't sail, we do not have adequate uh, adequate crew on board and Thornton said he was aware of that but he was going to cast off stand off a bit and then round them up and then they'd leave but at what seems to be a pre-arranged signal one of the crew who'd boarded threw his kit overboard and scampered down a rope and took off this was followed by a mass exodus and in the end about 30 or so crew departed the ship they then took themselves off to the, uh, the seamen's rest and drank a lot and started up a concert and had a, had a fairly splendid evening. Uh, the captain and the police could do very little to, uh, to stop this. And so they waited until the morning and the cold light of sobriety and the fact that unfortunately most of the crew had sent vir spent virtually every, um, uh, every pence they had on them. And they were gradually rounded up and an agreement was reached by which some crew agreed to rejoin the ship and others uh, were discharged there by mutual agreement. Uh, the ship, in spite of what had been suggested, did make it safely across the bite. And the immigrants, many of them were uh, sponsored immigrants, uh, nominated immigrants. They had contacts there. Some had family that were already waiting for them. There was a large contingent of women that were going over there to be domestics. Um, so most of these migrants already had a place to go um, and a job lined up waiting for them. So in spite of what was a horrific voyage, they were joyous to be there, although they did note that the weather seemed rather hot and they weren't too thrilled when they were informed that uh, it was only November and the weather was going to get hotter still. But in the end, they were glad to be, uh, glad to be off the uh, Belgic and they were delighted to be ashore in Australia. And the subsequent two voyages, that the Belgic did um, with the similar uh, uh, run of immigrants seem to have gone much smoother. So even though Thornton continued to deny that it was anything other than a few bad apples and absolutely denied that he had told the port official at Cape Town that he had called them the scum of the empire, um, in spite of all these difficulties, it seems that the White Star Line did take on the feedback and made improvements to the Belgic because the the next two voyages did not encounter any such um, any such uh, similar dramatic circumstances. And just a sideline here: the training ship Mersey. Now, this, strictly speaking, isn't on the uh, isn't on the passenger run, but it's one of those really interesting little sidelines. And there's a beautiful collection of photos. I could only, as you can see, I've kind of crammed a lot of photos into this, which makes a very bad slide composition. But it was extremely difficult to choose which ones to have. Um, the visit of the Mersey, which was a training ship uh, built in 1894 and purchased, uh, Einhold sailing ship, purchased by the White Star Line in 1908. Uh, we have a, a huge collection of photos. Obviously, Sam Hood was as fascinated as I am. There's all these photos of the apprentices at work. We see them there painting the ship, but there's others. They're working the capstans. They're working aloft. Wonderful photographs. Um, the uh, Mersey made six training voyages to Australia because the White Star Line, even though, of course, their focus was in steam, uh, there was very it was very strongly held in the merch, uh, a very strongly held belief in the merchant service at the time that uh, apprentices that was trained in sail made 
much better um, offices. And so the, <laughs> the White Star Line, which focused on uh, uh, operating steamships, um, ran their own training ship, uh, which could take up to 60 apprentices. It was responsible for quite a few firsts. It was the first sailing ship to have wireless apparatus uh, fitted. It was uh, also the first, apparently, on which uh, an appendectomy was undertaken on one of the students. There was, in addition to uh, the uh, mercantile crew, there was also a headmaster and an academic um, component to it as well. I think, though, that one of the most interesting people on board was uh, Ethel Corner, who we see there in that photograph. She was the wife of the captain, but she was very interested in wireless. Now, the ship did have an accredited wireless operator. It was the headmaster, but she was very adept at it as well. And she had hopes when she was in Australia of sitting, uh, of sitting her um, uh, examination so she could be certified. And you can see her there in that photograph that ran in the Sunday Times uh, working the wireless apparatus, but she was not even allowed to sit the examination in Sydney. And I'm hoping to do more research. And I do hope that at some point Ethel was able to gain her wireless certification. And another aspect of the White Star Line service during this time is, of course, um, as troop ships. You would have noticed that the um, advent of the Jubilee Line and the inauguration of the service to Australia coincided with the, Boer, the Second Boer War. And in fact, on their maiden voyages, virtually all of these, well, certainly the Medic and the Persic and the Afrik all carried troops for South Africa. We see them there boarding um, the SS Medic, usually as a contingent addition to other um, uh, in, to other paying passengers. But one of the interesting vessels that came down here during this period was the um, was the Britannic, which had been um, one of the most notable of the Atlantic Line ships built in 1874, but at 5,000 ton uh, and only 450 foot with a single screw, by 1900, she was really becoming um, superseded by newer technology and new ships. We had the fabulous Second Oceanic in 1899, uh, which was the first ship to exceed uh, uh, Isambard Kingdom, Brunel's Great Eastern in length. And uh, of course, leapfrogging each other in those early years of the 20th century. You've got all those splendid Cunardas, um, the Lusitania, the Mauritania, and of course, the Olympic class vessels. So really, um, by 1900, Britanni, uh, Britannic was already becoming, um, uh, uh, reaching the end of her use by date, but she was chartered by the uh, British government in 1899 as a troop ship um, designated HMT his Majesty, Her Majesty's Troop Ship 62 and carried nearly a thousand troops on her first voyage. You can see her there with uh, a white painted hull. Um, also did two, uh, two um, trooping voyages to Australia. Now, Bertram Hayes, who achieved fame later as the um, master of the Olympic during World War I. Bertram Hayes wrote a fascinating memoir, which is glorious for its, um, as much for its assumptions and its bigotry and it's, it's you know, very much a piece of its age. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all this extra, you know, the idea of Irish home rule and his antipathy to it. He's a, he's a fascinating character. He has an entire chapter devoted to those two trooping voyages with the Australians. And as you can see there, I don't know whether it's large, appearing large enough on your screens, but he called that chapter... Oh, those Australians. And he did not mean it in a remotely complimentary sense. Um, he uh, most, most of the British steamship captains and crews of these vessels, when they write of Australians, they tend to take a very benign eye of, you know, the, the colonial irreverence and you know the you know young nations that are that are not afraid of authority and so on they, they tend to take a fairly benign eye of the Australian um, larrikinism the larrikinism that Australians so like to pride themselves on not Bertie Hayes um, he wrote an entire chapter on how 
badly behaved they were and how they wouldn't follow orders and the only way to control them was to be extra harsh. The other fascinating thing about him is he seems to be under the impression that Tasmania was an entirely different um, country. He talks more than once about Australians, New Zealanders and Tasmanians as if they are three different entities. Um, it's, a fa- it's a fascinating read, very much of its era and a glimpse into what it was like running on a troop ship at that period, at least from a captain's point of view. And of course, with World War II, uh, World War One rather, um, the, um, uh, the Jubilee class and the ceramic were all called into action. Initially, they were on their regular routes, but then they were very soon um, uh, uh, recommissioned by the Australian government. And we have there, and they were allocated trooping numbers, for example. Uh, we have there the Medic um, as A7. In a lot of photographs from this period, they're censored. You can actually see that the troop number is, um, is scratched out. Superb image there of um, the ceramics signed by AIF. A lot of the earliest voyages were to Mudros um, uh, to support the Dardanelles campaign, the Gallipoli campaign. Um, ceramic in 1915 was the largest ship to then pass through the Suez Canal. It grounded, but they did manage to get it afloat. And then later in 1917, um, they were the commissioned by the um, recommissioned by the um, uh, <laughs> not recommissioned. They were um, uh, they were um, brought under the um, uh, the British government's um, uh, liner program. Um, to both build supplies and, of course, troop. Now, unfortunately, uh, one of the, most of them made it through the war. They had some very narrow scrapes, but very unfortunately, the AFRIC um, was lost in 1917. It was sunk in the English Channel uh, on the return voyage. It was, oh, no, it was outbound, it was, um, sailing between Liverpool and Plymouth. Um, it was torpedoed by a German submarine with the loss of 22 people and 145 survivors. But the other vessels uh, did manage to survive. And it was reported in 1919 that the ceramic, Swavic, Runic, Persic, African, Medic had carried some 112,000 Australian troops. The ceramic was able to carry as many as 3,000 on a, on a single voyage. And then, of course, there was the return voyage and there's that wonderful publication there, The Runic Rag, which is a whole collection of articles, cartoons and uh, stories published by the troops on their return, which is when, um, uh, which is when a lot of them started their, uh, their return voyages to, um, to Australia repatriating Australian troops. Eventually they were handed back to the White Star Line and resumed service. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, throughout the 1920s, there was a lack of investment in by the White Star Line in their stock. And this is where they start to overextend. I have a friend, Mark Chernside, who's written quite extensively on why the White Star Line failed when it had been so successful and why up until 1930, it was profitable year on year. But by, 19, by the 1920s, you've got an ageing fleet. The um, Jubilee class that have served so long and so well are really reaching the end of their, their service lives and gradually they are phased out through the 1920s. Um, in 1924, Lord Carl Sant was able to wrest control of the White Star Line back from the International Mercantile Marine and he had plans to expand the Australian service. And to that end, he bought shares in Shaw Savile. He uh, acquired the Commonwealth line. But uh, unfortunately, the, um, uh, there was already a surplus of tonnage on the Australian route. Uh, and he was overextending it. And then, of course, we launch into the Great Depression. So by the end of it, pretty much out of the ships that we have discussed, uh, the Medic, the, um, the Swabic, they've gone on to be Norwegian whalers. Uh, they've been sold off. And in 1934, following the Cunard and White Star Line merger uh, that was necessitated um, as part of uh, the government um, uh, bailing them out of the, the financial crisis of the early 1930s, uh, the merged company decided to withdraw from the Australian trade. They pass their, their, their vessels on, which pretty much at that point was the ceramic. 
onto, um, onto Shore Savile. Now, with Shore Savile, uh, ceramic continued to sail to Australia through the 30s. And even though by then, of course, it was becoming quite an aged vessel that remained a very popular one, and it actually underwent a refit um, in the late 30s. They even installed a, a lovely um, palm veranda. Um, unfortunately, though, of course, uh, with the advent of World War II, all that changed. And I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, even though it was no longer operating as a white Starline ship, the final fate of the ceramic, it was torpedoed at midnight uh, on between the on the night of 6th and 7th December um, 1942. It was carrying 377 passengers and 264 crew. Uh, the majority of those uh, of those passengers, uh, the passengers were military or naval. Um, they included members of the British uh, Army, the Royal Navy, the Australian Navy, Royal Marines, nurses. But there were also, um, there were also 133 passengers, um, 12 of them were children. The youngest was a one-year-old girl. They were torpedoed in the mid-Atlantic um, at about midnight. Um, the U- 515, which had torpedoed them, followed up with successive torpedoes that broke the back of the ship. They were able to launch about eight lifeboats full of survivors, but there was extremely stormy weather. The following morning, U-515 returned to the scene, um, hoping to pick up the ship's captain. By then it was blowing a Force 10 gale and they resolved to pick up the, the first survivor they found. Um, they found it, they saw a boat full of people waving, but they picked up one man from the water and that was um, a, a sapper engineer, a Royal Engineers sapper by the name of Eric Mundy. Um, he was the only, um, the only survivor. Um, some of the neutral countries in the, Azor the Azores did dispatch aid, but they were able to find no survivors. But um, I'd like to end just on that beautiful photo there it's one of my favorites in the collection and there's the ceramic sailing out through Sydney heads the queen of the southern seas in its heyday and on that slightly melancholy note we finish uh, our story of the white star line to Australia and if there's interest, anything that I have um, said that's of interest, um, or if you'd like to do a follow-up, I do encourage you. We have a wonderful collection here at the Museum's Vaughan Evans Library. I've just taken a quick shot, laid that out on my desk of some of the books I was consulting when I did this. There is a brilliant book there by Claire Hardy, who uh, was the granddaughter of one of the, um, uh, one of the troops who died on the ceramic. Uh, and she worked with Eric Mundy, the sole survivor, and wrote this beautiful book, The Ceramic. And there are a few other quite rare books there, including Hull Down and the Ismay Line. And I've put a link up there, but do email if you, um, if you um, need further information. I've put a link up there to our collection where you can search online. I've barely, and I always, it's, I, I try to resist any iceberg puns whenever I'm talking about the White Star Line for obvious reasons, but I, we have barely scrape the surface or the tip of the iceberg on what the National Maritime Museum collection holds in terms of images of White Star Line crew, passengers, ships. And as I said, we are very happy to receive uh, any assistance in identifying. If you had a, a family member who sailed as crew on a White Star Line ship in that period, we'd be uh, delighted to hear if you recognise a relative or an ancestor there.